really nice to hear different perspectives on the issue and, and especially to be able to talk about, think about microplastics both from the policy and the regulation and the monitoring and the methods side all at the same time. So kudos to you guys who have organized this. So um, my name is Violet. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the Orange County Sanitation District. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about microplastics and wastewater, so a different perspective from what we've just heard um, and sort of why we should think about wastewater, what are sort of the issues involved, and then so talk a little bit about that broadly and then talk about a study that we're, we're doing right now. It's ongoing, so I don't have a lot of res results to share with you, um, but sort of some of the issues that we've tackled, troubleshooting, things like that along the way. So a little bit about OCSD, if you're not aware. It, um, we are a wastewater collection treatment and what we like to call a resource recovery um, agency. So we get about 185 million gallons of wastewater per day into our two plants, um, of which we treat. About 88 of that, 88 MGD, are released per day. Um, we have a 4.5 mile offshore outfall um, just off of sort of Newport Beach area. Um, and the rest of that, you'll see there's a big difference there, the rest of that is sent to the Orange County Water District. They use that to recycle into indirect potable reuse water. Um, so we serve about two and, a half, two and a half million people in Orange County. And um, you know, we don't just serve residential households, but also commercial and industrial sources too, and we have a really large pretreatment program. Um, and that could potentially come into play when thinking about things like microplastics. So, you know, why are we even talking about wastewater today? I'm actually, you guys have made it easy for me because you both mentioned wastewater in your talks previously. So it's pretty obvious there's some connection to environmental, um, environmental occurrence of microplastics. For OCSD specifically, you know, we have a mission to protect both environmental and public health through the resource recovery and the wastewater collection treatment that we do. So it, we're doing our due diligence to really understand our connection to microplastics. But waste, wastewater specifically, it contains a diverse source, diverse sources of microplastics that can come from households, industry, uh, commercial sources. Um, it represents a potential pathway to the environment, both aquatic, marine, and terrestrial. Um, it also is feed water to recycled water for potable reuse, so something to think about there. Um, but also I think it's interesting, something that you know, wastewater treatment plants can really think about is that we have a, an opportunity to really maximize removal and maximize the amount that is removed from the treatment train that gets into the environment. So there's opportunities there, not just risks. And something I just want to uh, dwell on for a, a brief second, because I think it comes up a lot and something that I've started thinking about more and more recently is the difference between sources and pathways. And as a wastewater treatment plant, you know, it's something that um, we think about a lot because we're not necessarily generating these microplastics. <coughs> um, it's possible there's a little bit of that with some of the um, different equipment that, that is used throughout the plant. But for the most part, we're a passive recipient, right? So we're getting all these different sources of potential microplastics from these, these different you know, industry, commerce, um, domestic, and potential just littering um, sources. Um, and so wastewater treatment plants represent just one pathway in addition to stormwater and air deposition, um, things like that to be considered. And I, I think that this is beginning to gain you know, a lot of attention because we want to understand what the issues are and what the, um, you know, how much microplastics in the environment and why and where it's coming from, but it's really complicated. I know you guys are working on that. There's a lot of different people starting to work on that, um, and I think it deserves a lot of attention. And specifically, when we talk about sources of microplastics and wastewater, um, you can think of it, you know, from the, mic the primary side, so, you know, we could potentially have plastic pellets from uh, manufacturers, we can have industrial cleaning agents and abrasives, again from the industry side, um, personal, uh, just personal different products, personal care products um, containing microbeads, and then on the secondary side of things, 
there can be a lot of different sources that come into wastewater pathways, um, including sources from um, potential uh, tire, uh, abri uh, tire debris, textiles, that's a big one, right? We talk a lot about uh, different microfibers coming into wastewater treatment plants or seeing them in the environment, and then the breakage of mic macroplastics in the environment as well. So when it comes to wastewater treatment plants, I think this there have been quite a few, a lot, a lot of good studies in the last um, five or so years that have looked at, are uh, starting to look at how microplastics are removed in wastewater treatment plants. And in general, what we see is that wastewater treatment plants weren't really designed to remove you know, all of the debris out there, but we, they do a pretty good job. So if you look at the graph here, so if you have 100% you know, of your microplastics coming in to a plant, generally what we see, the trends that have been found, um, are they can be removed from 40 to 60% at that um, primary stage of treatment, and then um, at all the way to all the way to 0.2 to 14 percent after secondary types of uh, wastewater treatment, down to 0.1 to 2 percent if you have a tertiary, a, a final uh, type of wastewater treatment, and then you'll see too that all these pathways lead down to sludge and biosolids, right? So. It's not that these microplastics are being removed and they're being magically you know, disappeared. <laughs> they're going into another form and that's the sludge and the biosolids. Um, and I just wanna point, uh, get, point your attention to um, this graph being, coming from a recent review paper by Sun et al. It's a, a really great review paper that um, has looked at all of the research, most of the research done in wastewater treatment plants and microplastics over the last decade or so. But one thing I want to point out here is that even though studies have shown that um, wastewater treatment plants can remove up to 99% of the microplastics coming in, that number, that percentage can mean a lot of different things, right? Depending on the sources coming into a wastewater treatment plant, depending on the volume treated, all those factors can change what the actual output is. So if you look at this table, the main takeaway, I know there's a lot of numbers on there, but the main takeaway is that that discharge in particles per day can vary quite a bit. So if you have 99.9% .9 removal, that might mean that you're discharging a little under a million particles per day, or you can have 98% removal and be discharging 65 particle, million particles per day. So there's a lot of variation there, right? And there's a lot of factors that come into play on what that means and why that is. So just something to, to file away and something that shows how complicated it is too and the, the potential risks involved. And when we talk about what, what types of microplastics are, are generally being found in wastewater treatment plants, um, the trend follows a lot of what we see in environmental studies as well where a majority are fibers and then fragments, and then you see the other types, the spheres, the films, and the foams. So that, that tends to hold true, granted with quite a bit of variation, as you can imagine. So switching gears, that, that's sort of the general overview of wastewater and, and why I think about it and, and an introduction there. Um, I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about a study that we're doing at Orange County Sanitation District. Um, and this is something that we're, we're just you know, starting. It's something that we're just starting to think about. It's a first step and something that you know, I'd be really interested in is to talk methods with everyone here and solicit recommendation, recommendations and suggestions and, and have this conversation. So right now, our primary goal is to determine the baseline just occurrence types, quantities of microplastics at OCSD and we're especially interested in comparing the effectiveness of different secondary treatment types because at OCSD we have an activated sludge secondary treatment and we also have trickling filters as a type of secondary treatment. Um, we're not too sure how they compare in terms of removal strategy, so it's an opportunity to provide recommendations on for future wastewater treatment plants on what might be more effective. Um, and also start to look at a little bit the role of recycled water waste as we um, start to recycle more and more of our wastewater 
for portable reuse and understand what that means for discharge outputs of microplastics. And I want to give a shout out. This is a, a collaboration with um, master student Velvet Park, who is sitting over here, and then Phil Getalanga, and they're both at CSU Fullerton. I don't think you guys have to introduce yourselves. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, we've been doing this together where we've been um, processing the samples at OCSD and Velvet and Phil are working on the sample characterization and identification and those techniques. So, um, you guys can direct those questions to Velvet. <laughs> so, in terms of um, a sample locations, so I'll just actually put this whole thing. This is a very rough schematic of what we have. Um, at our plant, uh, but essentially, let's see if this works. Or not really. Okay, you can just follow along sort of from left to right. But basically, we have a preliminary treatment, primary treatment. So we're sampling the influent after this preliminary screenings, um, and then a primary effluent, both at our plant one and our plant two. And then you'll see sort of a, a, the trickling filter line and the um, activated sludge line. So those are our two types of secondary treatment. Um, so we're sampling effluent from both of those stages. We're sampling effluent going to and from our recycled um, water project, um, the final effluent, and then of course all of the sludges and the final biosolids from each of these different treatment processes. Oh, this is automatic. I don't even have to touch it. Yeah, it stays on. Oh. <laughs> um, so for sample collection, so this is sort of our, our final design of what we've been doing, um, but it has come with quite a bit of troubleshooting and trying different things. Claire talked a lot about the importance of methods and using a standard protocol. Um, one thing I think that we've learned that I'm sure everyone here has learned is that um, there's a lot of customization required for different types of matrices, and we're just looking at a wastewater treatment plant, but just throughout the plant, we have to try different things. So one thing that we've done is um, vary the amount of sample that we collect. So we've been doing collecting about uh, half a liter to a liter for our influence, mostly just because they are so, so dense, uh, densely packed with organics and um, all those materials. It's just impossible to process much more. Um, up to 30 liters of effluents. And in the grand scheme of things, this is on the lower side for what other studies have done when they've collected thousands of liters of wastewater, especially the final effluent. Um, but for us, what we chose to do is use our standard compliance auto samplers, our 24 hour um, auto samplers. And that way we have a representative um, idea of what we're getting over a 24 hour period. And we're kind of limited in how much volume we can collect especially in these giant glass bottles. And that picture is just a snapshot of all of the samples that mm -hmm. we end up collecting on a certain day. For the sledges, we also had to vary. We collected between five and 50 grams of sample. And those are grab samples. So this is velvet. Um, in the lab, what we have done, which is pretty standard, is um, you know, measure the amount of volume that we're looking at, sieved, um, to reduce the volume so that we can do more effective digestion and rinse that particulate matter on the sieves. And then conducted a catalytic wet peroxide oxidation digestion with Fenton's reagent. One of the things that we found is doing this a couple times for influent has been really helpful to try and reduce some of that um, cellulose material, that, of which is really, really dense. Um, so doing that a couple times with rinses in between has been really helpful to, to really break down that organic material. Um, and this looks way more orange than it does in real life. But anyway, <laughs> these are photos sort of the progression of how much um, organic material you see at the bottom of a, of a sample beaker, what it looks like while it's digesting, and then that clarity of it over time. And this is a, a video that just shows what, what that looks like. Um, so you see the reaction starts to happen right away. As soon as you add the hydrogen peroxide, that's a part of that um, reagent makeup. Um, and you'll see immediately there's going to be bubbling and frothing as the digestion progresses and the color changes. 
So it goes from a, this, for example, is a sludge sample, goes from a pretty thick, dirty brown sample to um, like a, a nice, like, cola, like mixed drink <laughs> type of coloration. <laughs> um, and then for solids, um, we have to use a, a bit of a different strategy. So we still run a digestion to break down that organic matter. And I think this is somewhat similar to what some of the folks here do for sediments. Um, but then we run a density separation um, using calcium chloride um, in these separatory funnels where we shake for a minute, let sit overnight, collect the top supernatant, and do that again to try and collect all the floating microplastics. And that's what the, the difference looks like overnight. And then at the very end, for all of those different samples, you know, we size fractionate um, using sieves again. So for this study, we've been going down to 45 microns. That's our smallest sieve size. Um, so that's pretty much the functional range of the sizes that we're looking at. And um, we found that's a pretty good balance. I haven't actually tried like, anything smaller, like 20 microns, but it would be really daunting, I think, for some of our samples. So this is a pretty good um, place to start for now. And then filtration. And so this is what everything looks like um, at the end of sample collection. So this is just one replicate. We've done this a couple times at different dates. Um, so you can imagine it's a lot of work for quantifying and characterizing. And then I'll just zoom through this. Um, we, um, this is where Julia Velvet and Phil have been working on the characterization and quantification. And just as an example of some of the things that we've seen, this is an example on the left, picture on the left of what it looks like when you don't properly digest your influent. That's all cellulose, or most, you know, it's a lot of cellulose, and then improvements on the right side. Some examples of what we see in secondary effluents, so some microbeads and fibers, um, a lot of different constituents that we're working on confirming. And then something that we've added that we can, I think we're gonna talk about in this workshop is the addition of Nile Red. These are some photos from quite a, a while ago, um, a bit more updated photos, but um, we've used that, started to use that as a quantification strategy, especially for um, these samples that have so much material on them. Um, and then this just shows sort of some of the steps that we've taken to start to confirm um, what we have in our samples. I'll breeze through them because I don't, um, basically we're just, we have found that we've We've seen some definite like polyethylene, silicones, um, different confirmed plastics in our samples. And I think I just want to end here because it's something that, um, as a wastewater agency, I feel has been one of the trickiest things is that there, there's so much effort and troubleshooting and customization required for this study that you know, we've been doing on our own, but this is where having standard protocols would be really helpful and also to compare because we see these huge variations from agency to agency. Um, and this chemical confirmation that's really necessary because when you look at these filters with so much stuff on them, you know, you can do your best at um, visual identification, but it's pretty tricky. So with that, um, I'll leave uh, both my contact information and Velvet as well. Um, and maybe just a little plug that I think there's a lot of research opportunities to work on, especially looking at different removal strategies and things like that at, at our agency with the caveat that you have to wait for me to get back from maternity leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, thank you.